Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight's presentation is called The Ecological Crisis is a Spiritual Crisis. And this did not work. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, there we go. As you can see from the slide. Uh, you know, I think it could, you could say that uh, nature is at the very root of Buddhism. Buddha was born in a grove of trees. He left the palace for a forest. He gained enlightenment under the protection of a tree, and he touched the earth as a witness to his awakening. Monshin has said, Buddha nature is nature. And that seems to be in agreement with Zen Master Dogen is saying here in this quote that's on the screen. Now we find ourselves at a threshold moment for nature, which is to say for humanity and the web of life of which we are a part, we will either as a species rise to the challenge of our perilous moment in history by fixing a problem of our own making or suffer catastrophic consequences. Unfortunately, this is not a hysterical conspiracy theory. This is science that is saying this. This past summer was the summer when the climate crisis and the ecological crisis of which it was a part ceased to be an abstraction for many of us. Here in the Northeast, we felt the crisis in our lungs as we breathed the unhealthy air from the Canadian wildfires. We saw extreme weather as front page news day after day, fires and floods seem to be happening at unprecedented pace and magnitude. Record high temperatures were recorded all over the globe. July was the hottest month in recorded history. And the trend line is not good. Temperatures are rising much faster now than at any time in the last 2 million years. Antonio Guterres, who is the UN Secretary General, has said the era of global warming has ended, the era of global boiling has begun. Uh, yes, we are in an ecological and climate crisis. Buddhism, as Monshin has described to us on occasion, is a search for the nature of reality. That reality now includes a planetary calamity. What is the nature of this reality? We can look at the various parts of the problem and say, for example, that carbon emissions from the burning of fossil fuels are unraveling the ecosystems of Earth. Absolutely and scientifically true. But when we look more deeply, we see that underneath all the moving parts is a spiritual crisis of vast proportion. So what do our Buddhist teachings tell us about how to live in a time of ecological crisis? We will not get specific answers. There was no ecological crisis of planetary proportions in the time of Buddha or at the time of Nagarjuna, Shigi, or Saicho. But that does not mean that the teachings cannot support and guide us now. In some of his earliest teachings, the Buddha identified three poisons or three fires, three negative qualities of the mind that cause most of our problems and most of the problems in the world. Three poisons are greed, anger, and delusion. We don't need to look very far to see the three poisons at work in the ecological crisis. We see them every day in the news and in the streets. And if we pay honest attention, we can see them in our own minds and action. Our Buddhist teachings also tell us of the antidotes to the three poisons. Those are the three wholesome or positive attitudes essential to liberation. Generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. Our, dom, our Dharma talks here at Tendai Buddhist Institute often refer to these qualities since they are so central to our practice. So already we have a place to start our grounding for these perilous times. Buddhism also teaches us to be open to and bear witness to the suffering of sentient beings including ourselves. When we allow ourselves to look deeply at the present state of things, we might feel grief, despair, or a sense of helplessness. 
the three poisons seem overwhelming and the problems of the world insurmountable. At such times, it's pretty easy <clears throat> to just withdraw and give up. Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh was asked the question, with all the madness and violence going on in the world nowadays, how do you keep yourself from losing faith in humanity and giving up altogether? Here is his answer. It's a practice called um, the practice of taking refuge. You want to, uh, to feel safe, to feel uh, protected. You want to feel calm. So uh, when the situation seems to be uh, turbulent, overwhelming, full of suffering, we have to practice taking refuge in the Buddha, the Buddha in ourselves. Because each of us has uh, that seed of Buddhahood, that capacity of being calm, being understanding, being uh, compassionate, and take refuge in, in that island of uh, safety within us. So can we, man we can maintain our humanness, our peace, our hope. It's like um, a boat crossing over the ocean. If uh, they uh, encounter a storm, and if everyone on the boat panic, and then the boat will turn over. So if there is one person in the boat who can remain calm, and then that person can inspire other people to be calm, and then there will be uh, hope for the whole boat load. Who is that person? who can stay calm in the situation of distress. In Mahayana Buddhism, the answer is you. You have to be that person. You'll be the savior of all of us. This is a very strong practice, the practice of Bodhisattva, taking refuge. And in a situation of war, injustice, if you don't practice like that, you cannot survive. You lose yourself very easily. And if you lose yourself, we have no hope. So it counts on you. Instead of talking about all of the humanity, which was what the question was, Thich Nhat Hanh addresses the sense of despair in the question. He instructs us to find that inner sanctuary as an antidote to despair arising from the three poisons. When coming from that place of equanimity, we can be our most effective, we can best utilize the higher or skillful means and be engaged in this. The Buddhist teaching of interpenetration is also fundamental to understanding our ecological peril. The Dharma teaches us that the idea of an independent, enduring self is a delusion, and this delusion is a principal source of dukkha. There is no other. We are all part of the unfolding conditions of things as it is. And that's grammatically correct. But as a species, humans have developed a separation from nature, which is all too often viewed not as a living system of which we are inextricably a part, but as a cupboard of resources for our use and consumption. Consumption that, like desire in the Bodhisattva vow, is inexhaustible. Joanna Macy, an author, activist, and scholar of Buddhism and deep ecology, has something to say about this. Thich Nhat Hanh said, remember when he was asked what's the most important thing we can do for the sake of life on Earth? And I think his questioners were asking, you know, should we work in the system or sit on a zafu or meditate or climb the barricades? He didn't go strategic at all. He said, what we most need to do is to hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. 
to hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. Every spiritual tradition somewhere in it has a comment or a story or a metaphor about mistaken identity. And this incredible crisis for uh, conscious life on planet Earth can be understood as that, that we've been thinking that we were consumers. We've been thinking that we were laborers in the uh, machines of the industrial growth society. We were thinking that we had to get, a get, get ahead as separate selves, compete, win, look out for number one, all the time imprisoned in this shrink, shrunken sense of self. And now this crisis is telling us, sort of slapping us in the face, saying, wake up. You are life on Earth. The ecological crisis might also engender feelings of grief. We are losing life-sustaining biodiversity at an alarming rate. The sixth extinction, another part of the ecological crisis, has begun. You could say that the Earth is dying, or at least parts of it are. It's as if countless gems in Indra's net are going dark. As we lose companion beings and see the beauty of the natural world receding, feelings of grief are a natural response. Joanne Macy once again. We are living members of a living planet. We're like cells in a living body. That body is being traumatized. So of course we feel it. Of course. It arises from our profound caring, and that caring is grounded in our interconnectedness with all life, our interexistence with all life. And that's been true for life since the beginning of space-time. <coughs> we forgot it for a while. We began to exploit each other and the earth for separate advantage and greed and fear grew. But so what, um, what the mainstream society would have us think of as, oh, some personal neurotic response and have us reduce our grief to a kind of um, private nothing neurosis is actually uh, when we behold it and walk through it, it becomes a doorway into a vaster realization of a life and of our identity, our interexistence with all life. So that's why I think that the, the crisis itself is both the uh, mirrors the mistake we've made, but it also becomes an opportunity for our awakening. Mm -hmm. What might the spiritual path of awakening in and to our time that Joanna is describing look like? Again, what does Buddhism offer us as a guide? The discussions on Buddhist history we've had here in the Kuri we have learned that Buddhism, as it traveled from India to China, Korea, and Japan, it both influenced the culture in each of those places and it was influenced in turn. David Loy, a Zen practitioner, scholar, and author of the book Eco Dharma, has pointed out that now, in the current era, Buddhism is both influencing and being influenced by what has become a world civilization at a time when that civilization is in the process of destroying itself. He believes that Buddhism's greatest potential to reduce suffering could be right now, at this point in history. Mm -hmm. He offers a Buddhist path of the Bodhisattva for our time that he calls the path of the Ecosattva, and a Dharma for our time he calls the Ecodharma. I'll let David explain his own ideas. Mm -hmm. The basic idea of the Bodhisattva path is always that one is concerned to become awakened, not just for oneself, but in order to help everyone. 
and therefore bodhisattvas, including ecosattvas today, they have a double practice. It's not simply that you work on your own awakening or enlightenment, but that you realize that that's insufficient, that you also have to embody that in terms of how you help other people. And given the kinds of challenges that we're facing today, which are very much institutional, it's not enough simply to work individually in order to address the situation, but that we have to find ways to work together with other people. Because the kinds of challenges we're facing today are institutionalized. Buddhism emphasizes what's sometimes called the three poisons or the three fires, greed, ill will, and delusion. And I think we need to recognize that they are very much at the heart of the problem we face today. I mean, when we ask, you know, where do the problems come from? Why have we created the kind of ecological situation we're in now? I think it can be traced back to those, but not just on an individual level. Our economic system is a form of institutionalized greed. If greed means you never have enough. Uh, corporations, for example, are never big enough, never profitable enough, their market share is never big enough, consumers never consume enough. There's a certain orientation built in here that I think fits in with the Buddhist critique of greed, always wanting more. One of the things that strikes me most about the ecological crisis is that how it really seems to be a larger version of the individual problem that Buddhism has always addressed. I mean, one way to understand the, the fundamental problem according to traditional Buddhist teachings is that ultimately at the root cause of my dukkha suffering or dissatisfaction is the delusion of a separate self. The delusion that there's a me inside that's separate from other people and the rest of the world outside. And we can understand Buddhist meditation practices as helping us forget ourselves, as Dogen says, or let go of ourselves and realize our non-duality, realize that we're not separate from other people. But isn't the ecological crisis exactly the same thing writ large? Except that the sense of self here, or, or the sense of separation, it's not just the individual, but it's the collective. It's our contemporary civilization, or even the whole human species, which feels separate from the rest of the earth. We have learned to exploit the earth, to treat the earth as an other, as a source of resources for us. And in the process, we have lost track of the fact that the earth it's not just our home, it's our mother. The earth isn't some place that we just happen to live. It's the source. It's like we ourselves are one of the many, many ways in which the earth is taking form and manifesting. We need to realize that. So it, it, the parallel to me is quite striking. It's just a larger version of what Buddhism has always been talking about, overcoming the sense of separation, overcoming the sense of duality. And I think it's getting clearer and clearer that unless we find a way to do that collectively, I think it's pretty unlikely that we'll ever be able to solve the ecological crisis. We're walking into uncertainty. That's not new. Uh, but what is at stake is, in past human history, in times of darkness, we could always rely on nature's enduring presence to offer a way forward. Now nature itself is being threatened. What does the future hold? Will we move away from an endless growth model that a finite planet cannot continue to support and toward a path of sustainability? Or will we descend into unmanageable chaos or maybe something in between? We simply do not know. Buddhism teaches us not to fear this uncertainty, but to accept and even embrace it. It's very difficult to anticipate what's going to happen, but in many ways it doesn't look good. We just don't know. Have you heard that before? We just don't know. Is that familiar? At least in the Zen world, this is something that we cultivate. Huh? Don't know mind. Huh? Not knowing is most intimate. The importance of not knowing here is that it, 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 it enables us to be much more spacious, 
more aware of our own reactivity, uh, more open to the perspective of others, not so fixated. Uh, but it's more of a way of engaging with the world right as it is here and now. We don't know what's going to happen next, but we do the best we can, responding appropriately as best we can according to what we understand. But at the same time, we're ready to change that as our understanding of the situation changes. One of my teachers, Robert Aitken, liked to say that our task isn't about clearing up the mystery, but making the mystery clear. The spiritual path isn't about, oh, now I understand everything, but opening up to a mysterious and sacred world where everything is changing, whether we know it or not. And, you know, bodhisattvas access this mystery, not by kind of grabbing it and understanding it, but opening up to it, being taken by it. That's the sense in which we end up uh, transcending our egos. And therefore, this awesome mystery isn't something debilitating, but empowering, because it does liberate us from dogmatism and fixed ideas. We do the best we can, although we understand that we never know for sure what's happening or even what's possible, right? It's been said that we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation to be able to do anything about it. We still have agency and we can alter the outcome, but science tells us that we have to work with urgency. In my own attempts to find a way to react appropriately to the ecological crisis, I found a helpful perspective from Domio Burke. Domio is a Soto Zen priest and teacher. She is the leader of the Brightway Zen Center in Portland, Oregon, and the author of a podcast that I look forward to called the Zen Studies Podcast. Here are excerpts from one of her podcast episodes about what she calls crisis Buddhism. As Buddhists, we care deeply about the suffering in the world and know we're interdependent with all life. But how do we face what's going on without becoming overwhelmed or depressed? How do we stay true to our values and aspirations despite being trapped in a system that destroys life? How do we sustain our practice, strength, and positivity in the midst of a slow-moving ecological catastrophe? How can we respond appropriately with realistic urgency but avoid burning ourselves out? Crisis Buddhism addresses all of these questions by asking us to mindfully balance three essential areas of practice. Bearing witness, taking action, and taking care. Bearing witness means learning about the suffering of the world in all its forms in order to make wise decisions, activate our natural compassion, and awaken a sense of urgency. Taking action means participating in a tangible way to help alleviate or prevent the suffering we witness. And taking care means engaging in activities, relationships, and practices that sustain us. The principal task before us as we practice what I call crisis Buddhism is to skillfully and sustainably balance our time and energy among the three areas. The attention and resources we devote to each area will vary over the course of our lives and will depend on our circumstances. There's no set ratio among the areas that a quote-unquote good Buddhist will achieve. And maintaining the right balance is an ongoing process for each one of us. At no point should our attempt to practice crisis Buddhism lead to judgment, harshness, a sense of superiority, or a sense of inferiority. No matter what our views on how the world should be or how we should respond to it, we aim to interact with people respectfully and skillfully, sincerely concerned for the well-being of all involved. Over and over again, I've heard my students and friends express concern over ecological breakdown and all of the human ills that have contributed to it and will be exacerbated by it. 
like racism, greed, resource inequality, and an exploitative attitude toward nature. They say, I can't spend too much time reading the news or thinking about these issues. There's nothing I can do. Oh no, I think inwardly when I hear this sentiment expressed. We have to come together and act. As Margaret Mead famously said, quote, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Well, I'm not sure it's going to take a small group this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although small relative to 8 billion people might be a few million to be the catalyst for change. You know, there's many reasons to take action in response to the ecological crisis. Lots and lots of reasons. To my mind, perhaps the most immediate and compelling reason is protecting today's children and the generations yet to come. This little guy was at the climate march that we were at just 10 days ago. You know, it's simply immoral to steal the future from them. Think about the position we put these kids in. They worry about being slaughtered in a mass shooting and in their classrooms, classrooms where we ask them to prepare for an uncertain and perilous future. No wonder they're anxious. And as they look around, they don't see the adults addressing the situation with the seriousness and urgency that it deserves. So young people have formed groups like Fridays for Future, started by Greta Thunberg, the Sunrise Movement, to prod us forward. This photo actually was the youth climate strike in Albany in 2019 at West Capitol Park. Uh, this quote is from the author and climate leader, Bill McKibben. He's the founder of 350.org and Third Act. And you see his op-eds in the New Yorker and New York Times from time to time. And he's right on point. But there's something a little undignified about taking the biggest problem the world's ever gotten into and asking junior high school students to solve it for you. Indeed. <laughs> Let's hear once more from Joanna Macy. Here she mentions the great turning. That's her term for transitioning to a life-sustaining path. And the great unraveling, her term for ecological and societal collapse. I see us on the way into the future as walking always with uncertainty. We don't know whether the great unraveling or the great turning is going to be the end of the story. But I know where I want to get behind. And I know the people that I love and link arms with get behind. And as we walk toward the possibility of a life-sustaining society, we're on a path together, but we better link arms because there's a ditch on either side of this road. And one ditch is paralysis, shutting down because we feel too puny and too guilty and too weak to see what's happening or too victimized. And the other ditch is panic. And there's enough social hysteria going around. I don't think we need to scold people. <coughs> people know that the whole life on earth is in danger. They are aware of it in their bodies at any rate. Help them feel the strength to feel life within them and move together and make that choice. It's a choice that has to be made minute by minute. That's where your urgency comes in. <laughs> I shaved. I saved the show stealer for the end. <laughs> That's Bella. She's a good doctor. <laughs> so now's when I really like to hear what all of you think.